yeah, so my name is Carrie Miller. Uh, I'm a developer in the Seattle area. And uh, Failure for Fun and Profit is the title of my talk. And you can see I just failed. <laughs> Which is, yeah, but it's not fun. And it's certainly not profitable. What is fun and profitable, though, is having the only fun and profit talk at a conference. Um, so my talk is really about uh, using failure to learn things. Because if you are not making mistakes, if you're not taking your code apart and breaking it on purpose to see what little gears and bits fall out and then put it back together and see what screws are left over, if you're not making that glorious, exhilarating mess that Sandy talks about, how can you say that you really know why it works or how it works? Um, to paraphrase uh, Nasruddin, good ideas come from experience, and experience comes from bad ideas. That's an awful lot like the scientific theory, which, uh, excuse me, the scientific method. Until we act like scientists and engineers that we are, we won't really truly learn these things. Now, I'm pretty sure that everybody here has cut and pasted something off of a gist or a blog post, just dropped in config initializers, and boom, that thing starts working. Or maybe you uh, went to Stack Overflow, copied somebody's crazy dumbass idea, and it ended up working. But do you actually know why that thing worked? Or did you just do it to get to done, to solve a problem that somebody was coming down on you for? If you don't poke and prod these things, you're not really going to understand why. And sometimes that's OK, because we have too many pressures on us in our day-to-day -day lives as developers to really sometimes really get into the, the why or the how of things. Robert Prisick said in the Zen of the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance that the real purpose of the scientific method is to make sure that nature hasn't misled you into thinking you know something that you don't actually know. Asking questions is how, as humans, we define what it is that we know and what we don't know. We find these boundaries. Having all the answers just means that you're asking really boring questions. And if you're always succeeding at what you try, you're only trying the achievable. Keep asking questions. That's ultimately the point. Keep trying the dumb things. Now, I have an awesome slide right here. And it's really cool. <laughs> um, how many people here um, are not CS grads? OK, it looks about 40%, maybe? I'm not actually a CS grad myself. I paid eighty thousand dollars for a liberal arts degree that I have only really a little bit used. Um, I was a uh, lighting designer. I was also a uh, professional poker player for a few years. I spent a year and a half as a puppeteer in a marionette theater company, <clears throat> and I was also a sous chef. I went to a culinary academy with Alton Brown, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I also have a lot of other hobbies. I'm a self-represented glass artist, which means about once a month I get a check for five dollars from Etsy. <laughs> and uh, I've published two role-playing games, pen and paper. And on the weekends, I'm probably planning my next long-distance hike, or I'm working on one of my vintage vespas. So I mention all that, not just because I'm pretty cool. I wouldn't really want to be that pretentious about it. But I have a lot of experience finding myself in a very awkward place, of not knowing what the hell I'm doing, of being a complete and utter novice at something. Um, we talk about learning curves, and sometimes those learning curves are shallow, and sometimes they're really, really steep. But just like a mountain, when we're standing at the base of a learning curve, it looks like it's a cliff. The experience of being out of your element and in your head is scary and intimidating. But you should find it to be thrilling, because you're about to learn something. You're about to increase your ability to affect change upon the world. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi said in his book, Flow, that not all experiences may be particularly pleasurable at the time they are taking place just like not having your slides with you. But afterwards, we think back upon this, this moment and say, that really was fun, and we wish that this that moment would happen again. After an enjoyable event, we know that we have changed, that we have grown. In some respect, we become more complex as a result of the experience. So why do we, why do we quail at the face of this learning curve? <clears throat> why is not knowing what we don't know, why is that stressful to us? None of us want to look foolish in front of our peers on GitHub or Twitter. But ultimately, perhaps, we don't want to look foolish in front of ourselves. It's exceptionally scary territory to not know what you're doing without a guide or a map to be in this unknown territory. But inside most of us, there's a memory of being a child where we played a game, perhaps a tag on the schoolyard or um, the cave game that uh, Steve was talking about, where we didn't really care anymore about who won or lost, or what our score was, or how fast we managed to finish the maze. We just did it because it was fun. The other day, I, was, I saw um, 
at a video game bar in Seattle. They, were, they had a Contra running on an old Nintendo. Oh, I remember playing that with my, my uh, siblings over and over and over again. It's like the entire game not dying. How many hours of my life did I waste placing that goddamn video game? But I didn't care. There was no consequence to me losing, just starting over. If we could make learning and experience that kind of fun, we find that we can attempt almost anything. There's nothing that we can't learn. If you want to learn something new, and you probably do, sharpen, if you want to sharpen an existing skill or talent, try removing the risk of failure. You can't really remove failure. You're going to fail because you don't really know what you're doing. So redefine failure from an event that happens to you to just a data point. OK, that didn't work. I'm going to try it again. I'm going to do it differently. Try it again and again. If you can find the excitement that got you into this, most of us have some element of being an engineer, of wanting to take things apart and understand how they work. If you can get back to that excitement, that initial thing that drew you into programming, if that is, in fact, your uh, reason d'etre, then you'll have a much better time of it. Get out some toys and play. So <clears throat> I am a developer in the Seattle area. And uh, at the moment, I work for Blue Box Group, uh, Ruby on Rails Enterprise, hosting, yada, yada. Um, and uh, I showed up on the first day and loved the office. It was great. We, had all, we have all the Geek Clubhouse toys. We have a main video cabinet with 1,500 odd you know, uh, re retro vintage video games. We've got ping pong. We have a kegerator with two kinds of beer on tap. And we've got a pool table. And the first day I showed up, I was challenged to a game of pool. And I said, great, we want the eight ball, nine ball cutthroat. You know? They said, no, we're going to play Calvin Pool. <laughs> what the hell is that? So Calvin Pool is a really interesting game that was invented at Blue Box and it's played pretty much only by Blue Box employees. Um, the rules are really simple. After the break, and it's your turn, your opponent picks the ball that you have to hit with the cue ball. So they pick basically the worst shot possible. All you have to do is hit the cue ball and then uh, you, you hit the cue ball to have it strike the, uh, the ball that your opponent picks out. <coughs> it's a little confusing, I'm sorry. Um, so there are a few wrinkles to it, how we keep score and you know, actually how you can score points in this game to win. But really, again, you're just gonna be making the same hard shots over and over again. Each shot is utterly impossible and it doesn't matter. There's no consequences. There's no second shot that you have to set up. There's no, if you don't make the shot, so what? Your opponent gets the ball and now you're gonna screw him. <laughs> now, I, I love pool. Um, I did mention that I was a professional poker player for a time and uh, poker player, pool hustler, kind of goes hand in hand. But uh, I was never very good. I joined the league, the beginner's league, and I finished at last. Um, but I still loved the game, um, playing for just the thrill of it. And so, as you can imagine, I lost my first game of Calvin Pool. I lost the first 10 games of Calvin Pool. But eventually I got better. And I started holding my own in the office. I'm in the middle of the pack now. Um, a few months after I started Blue Box, um, I went out with friends to play pool. Um, well, there just happened to be a pool table at the bar I went to. And uh, I broke, and I ran the entire table. And then we did it again, and I ran the table again. And my friends were just utterly amazed. I'm like, oh, I've been sandbagging this for years. This is horrible. How did you get here? What's going on? We're never going to play pool with you again. So now pool is on the list. They won't play poker, pool, scrabble, diplomacy, and monopoly. <laughs> so this is, a, this is, I tell you this parable um, story because this is a really great uh, sample of redefining failure. Being forced to make these impossible shots over and over again, removing all the consequences from failure, meant that I could try all these things that I've always wanted to. I could actually like experiment with like, how does English really work? If I spin it left or spin it right, how is it going to react when it uh, bounces off a cushion? I could try these multi-cushion shots that are really, really almost impossible if you just like fall, you find yourself in a bar and you try to play. I could explore all of these side effects and then when I return to regular bar pool or tournament pool, wow, my game is completely elevated because those skills were directly transferable. For me, learning new programming languages and techniques is exactly the same. I challenged myself to learn through exploration and trial. When I wanted to find out more about DCI, I read a whole bunch of blog posts, but I didn't try to apply it to my uh, one of my primary legacy apps, I built a little toy app and said, hey, how can I do this? How does it work? What are the problems with it? Crap, I don't ever really want to use this. 
Mm -hmm. If you're not running into things in your practicing that you don't know, then you're not really practicing. You're just, you're just fluffing around. <coughs> so how does, that actually, how does this actually work? What is the actual science behind why failure screws us up? Um, everyone familiar with the right brain, left brain split? Anyone not familiar with it? Uh, OK, so it's not actually a totally accurate model, but it's really good for layperson lay pers purposes. Um, the left, brain of our, left side of our brain controls math and logic. The right side controls language, art, math, um, poetry, music. In general, these two halves of our brain work together, but they're also very delicately balanced. When one comes to the fore, the other one steps back. You balance your checkbook, or you write a sonnet. You take a shot in pool, or you figure out how to order the next drink. Learning requires both of these kinds of thinking, however. It requires imagination and reasoning. You see, mentioned Plato earlier. Um, in his book, The Republic, it's a series of stories about philosophy. And one of them, um, Plato discusses the act of learning. And he teaches a slave the Pythagorean <coughs> theorem by asking a simple series of questions. And the point is, or one of the points you can take from that, is that learning is really the discovery of truth. It's not the acquisition of knowledge. It's the connection of these abstract ideas to create a new whole. We adjust our reality to incorporate new information, and then we proceed forward. We have a hypothesis. We create an experiment. We run the experiment, and then we adjust our hypothesis. We do this over and over again as humans. Cognitive scientists studying how stress um, impacted abstract reasoning did this experiment with monkeys. They took two groups of chimps. They treated one group of chimps really, really well. And we're going to give you guys all of the great, awesome toys, and you're going to be able to talk to each other. You're going to be super comfortable and have great food. And the other half, you're going to be kept in relative isolation. I'm going to feed you oatmeal all day, and I'm going to give you uh, random noises at night to wake you up. I'm going to stress you out and create a stressful environment. The scientists then took these two groups of chimps, and they showed them a card with a pattern of dots on it. And the dots happened to be the constellation Orion. And the chimps were taught that any time they saw this card, they would get a reward if they could push the button. Pretty standard cognitive scientific uh, experiment. The chimps were then shown a series of cards over and over again. And slowly, scientists would begin to reward them when they pushed the button when they saw something that looked kind of like Orion introducing variation into these patterns of dots. <coughs> so they, they, they basically taught the chimps that variation and abstract concept of forms and theory. They did this experiment. Great, they've got the data. They go away, they run the experiment again six weeks later. They, re they uh, repeat the results. Now they try it with the same two groups of chimps six weeks after that, but they introduce the constellation of Cassiopeia. So Cassiopeia will now earn the chimps reward as well. Now something really interesting happened here. The chimps who were treated very, very well and cushy and had happy lives, they picked up on this idea right away. They said, ah, Cassiopeia, boom, food pellet. Something that looks a little bit like Cassiopeia looks upside down, boom, food pellet. The stressed out chimps, no dice. They took just as long to learn all the variations. They were learning each individual variation could earn them a reward rather than the concept, the abstract concept of variation. Now, scientists have also run these, these sorts of experiments with rats in uh, mazes. And the same, the same effect appears to be isolated now. Small failures in stress before we succeed at something, when we are in a happy, stress-free environment, increases our retention of abstract memories. Large doses of stress, systemic stress, have a negative impact on the formation of memory. When stress, the brain prioritizes the here and now. It's a fight or flight response. It's classic. We don't waste energy trying to create new memory structures. We just get the hell out of here. Stress hormones flood the brain. Cortisone and adrenal, uh, adrenaline excuse me, just gushes through you. And you can't actually remember what's going on. Your brain stops processing dopamine. It stops uh, all the receptors shut down. So you can't get that little squirt of feel good success. And so your brain doesn't, doesn't learn that this is good. We should keep doing this. Calvin Pool removed all the stress. It takes away all the risks. It put the emphasis on fun, on com comrad uh, camaraderie, 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 and 
because we're expecting to fail and there's no one to impress, it lowers that stress, it lowers the social stress, and increases the pleasure reward cycle. For brains, this is a powerful stress because we are wired to learn stronger memories more quickly from fun and exciting environments. That's why children's uh, play schools are always so exciting and colorful. That's why I wear rainbow tie-dyes half the time, because it's fun and exciting. We're designed by nature to flourish through play. Almost all mammals have a stage in, in adolescent development where they play. And this is why tiger cubs are really, really cute. And they play with each other, and we humans can get in the pen with them and do our thing. But you don't want to do that with a full-grown tiger. It doesn't play around. However, you could do that with chimps, and you can do it with dolphins, and you watch them play with each other. These higher order social animals, once they develop their hierarchy, allow play to continue into adulthood. And this appears to be super important to long-term intelligence and brain plasticity as we age. <coughs> the philosophy of play, of play was really developed by Johan Huizinga, who's a Dutch philosopher. Um, he was a, also a comparative linguist, a cultural theorist, and a physiologist. Um, he wrote a really groundbreaking game theory book in 1938 entitled Homo Ludens, or Man at Play. And in it he said, the act of playing is an event which occurs within a specific boundary of space and time in which the normal rules of life generally don't apply and it is done for its own sake. We play because it is fun. And so he's saying that play begins and ends and it's within a specific time. It is recess. It is something that is outside of our normal lives. Our brains latch onto this outlying moment as more significant because, again, we're wired to pick up differences in our environment. So when something is out of the ordinary, we notice it. This is important. It might kill us or it might, you know, get us through the next day. So Heisinga talks about space and he talks about time. And space is really important. I have a wonderful slide for that. Um, <laughs> if you want to start to integrate play into your learning, patterns. You need to create a space that is separate from your everyday life. Um, you need to minimize the intrusions of the regular world into the sacred space. So turn off Twitter and the TV. Don't do it on your couch. Don't do it in your office. Don't go to your favorite coffee shop. Go to the library. Go anywhere you can get the resources that you directly need, but is different from your everyday realities. Um, I usually go to the Pacific Science Center in Seattle or the Seattle Aquarium, because they have Wi-Fi there. Mm -hmm. And I'll just sit in the lobby and you know, hack on something. Heisinga also says that we need time. And what's happening is that we say, time, we need to know when this time starts and when it ends, because it's recess. You know? It's not going to be, this is the new condition. It's, this is a place outside of time and space. Just like a plane flight, we know it's going to last three and a half hours. We get into a different mode, and now we're in traveler mode, and we're ultra compliant, and we never say the word bomb. You know, <laughs> this is a different space. You know, and we don't, we don't resent it. We, don't, you know, we know it's going to end, because you know, we're adults, so we can, we can realize that. So we set up space and time for ourselves, because also because we want to insulate ourselves from what's going to happen. Because what's going to happen is we're going to break a lot of stuff, and we're not going to succeed. And we're going to write some really bad code, because ultimately we don't care. And it takes a lot of courage to do this, and it takes a lot of good humor. So much of our daily lives is centered on being domain experts. I mean, if I don't know the right pattern or solution or whether or not I should use DCI, I'm going to fail. And if I fail, if I fail too much, I might not have a job. I might lose a client. And if I lose enough clients, that's, I'm not going to be able to pay my mortgage. I'm not going to be able to put food on the table. That's really risky. And so experimentation is very, very difficult. Even if you do it on a daily basis, if you're not in an environment that supports it, it can be exceptionally, exceptionally risky. So you need to be brave and like understand that your brain is going to be trying to tell you, oh, this is scary. We're, we're going to get eaten by lions if we keep doing this. So the courage to step into a place where the rules are different and the way forward. As I mentioned, I did spend $80,000 on a liberal arts degree. And uh, I'm very proud of that. It was a hippie school. I don't know if you, I know that seems a little odd. I live in a hippie school. But uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about there is the monomyth. This is Joseph Campbell's Jungian approach to understanding Western mythology. 
In it, the hero travels to a region in which the normal rules no longer apply. Um, the hero is in, is in their village, and then there's a beanstalk. Something, something propels them out of their ordinary realm. They're facing challenges. They have to hide from the giant. And then they stare into the abyss. And the abyss is generally the hero themselves. This is Luke on Dagobah when he goes down in and he fights Darth Vader in the spirit cave. And it's really himself. He faces himself in the mirror. The hero then returns to their normal reality, having won some sort of gift, whether it's a golden harp, or a goose that lays golden eggs, or you know, kick-ass ghost Yoda to hang out with. <laughs> and they're forever changed by this experience, and they no longer fit in their normal world. And so they're propelled out again. You see this, you know, I mentioned Star Wars, this is Harry Potter, this is Lord of the Rings, this is every mythology. This is how it works. And I'll skip about eight slides here. They were really awesome. So you've got this awesome place, and you've got this time, and you know it's going to end. It's uh, maybe it's 10 in the morning, and you don't have any meetings until noon. Um, so you want to get started, except now you have to send an email to your boss, because you remember that you promised him this report, it's, it's late. And there's a new pull request from that junior developer you just hired, and you really need to review his stuff. Yeah. These things happen. You, as you sit down to approach these things, your brain begins to distract you. Because it's like, this is a scary place that I'm in. This is a new sacred space. And reality begins to move through. Our brain becomes the abyss that we have to face here. It's trying to distract us with the relevant tasks, this, this stimulus addict we have in our cranium. It's uncomfortable to stare at a blank terminal window or to look at an abstract API document and be like, well, this is great. This is the AWS API. I want to do this thing, though. How do I translate from the thing I want to do to this complicated thing. I think I'll just go make a doctor's appointment. <laughs> this is where courage and humor comes in. If you give yourself time to get past this moment, if you just stick with it, relax, breathe, experience this moment, you'll find that in about 10 or 15 minutes, your brain starts to settle, and you'll start to engage with the work. Ken Robinson, uh, Sir Ken Robinson, excuse me, is an education reformer in the UK. And he coined and popularized the phrase aesthetic experience uh, in relation to how we learn. And he defines it as one in which our senses are operating at their peak when we are present with the current moment, when we are resonating with the excitement of this thing that we are experiencing when we are fully alive. And that is a really poetic and awesome place to be. And I think we've pretty much all been there as developers, except we describe it as flow. And this is the My Little Pony slide. <laughs> Mihai Csikszentmihalyi said in his book, Flow, that enjoyment appears at the boundary between boredom and anxiety, when the challenges are just balanced with the person's capacity to act. In trying to have this aesthetic experience, this learn learning moment, we walk this balance beam between anxiety and boredom. When we're learning, we don't have control over skill, but we do have control over the difficulty of the challenge that we're presenting to ourselves. In a pool tournament, we stare at the table, and we try to predict the path of each ball. Where's the cue ball going to end up? How many points behind am I? Can I win this game, or can I just like play through here so I can win the next three? We try to figure out all these things because they're stress. In Calvin Pool, though, we narrow down the entire set of variables down to just simply hit this one ball. It exists outside of normal time and space. Do this one task. There's no complications beyond the moment. There's no consequences to balance or consider, or ultimately be overwhelmed by. We can maintain happiness and flow state by controlling the challenge here. So don't get lost in that rat hole of what are you going to name this cool new gem that you just thought of. Don't worry about which framework you should actually use or even which language. I came to Ruby um, about five years ago. And uh, I actually came to it later than I should have. Because I tried to uh, use 186 in Rails 2. Like, this is awesome. This is a cool thing. I'm going to build a blog in five minutes. This is so much better than PHP. <laughs> Couldn't get my SQL to work. <clears throat> Screw this. These Ruby hipsters. What the hell? So, you know, I flipped the, the metaphorical table and didn't touch Ruby for another year. That's a really good example, though, of letting these, this irrelevant thing stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I could have gone and used Postgres or SQLite, but I didn't. I let this irrelevant thing stop me from experimenting and playing. 
because we were trying to create limits for yourselves, define one special rule, one special technique that you want to try and learn, and focus on that. Maybe it's you want to find out what DCI really is about. Maybe you really, you know, a little shame, and you actually really want to do tut it up. You're going to do it right this time in the start. Maybe you want to see what SLIM is about, or Hamel instead of ERB. Make life hard for yourself on purpose in this place, but you don't want to break yourself. You just want to stretch. You want to be just outside of your reach. You rapidly learn a lot about what you know and what you don't know by doing this. When you break down the problem that you're trying to, to work on, you deconstruct it, and then you obstruct it by adding one thing at a time. Now, I really recommend finding one simple, obvious task that you understand well and repeatedly solve it over and over again. Each time, add a complication. Each time, add an obstruction, but just one. By doing this, by taking this thing apart and seeing how this one <coughs> element affects it, you're being a scientist. You're applying the scientific method to your learning, and you begin to see how this one complication, this one technique, this one gem, how it changes the solution that you come up with. And it might even like change it up in how you define the question to begin with. Um, I have some things here that I can't do really without slides about um, some suggestions about what you could do. I like taking the uh, how do you convert temperature and the problem. And you're going to find all of the uh, solutions to that in about two minutes Googling. You're going to find blog posts and repos that solve it for you. But now, you know, solve that. But then make it a gem and release that. You'll learn about how do you make a gem. Make it a service. How do you do that? Make, it, make a mobile app. Use Ruby Motion. Maybe you could aggregate data over calculations and then use geolocating software to figure out, well, as people are doing this conversion, who does conversion where they do it? Do they do it at border crossings between the US and Canada? I, I mean, that's a hypothesis. Perhaps you want to make a third-party API. But each of these ideas of how you extend <coughs> temperature conversion is about finding that one thing that you want to detach away from the problem and learn about. Because ultimately, we're building models. We're building breakable toys. And just like a child, when we go out the sandbox and we play with our G.I. Joe's or our Barbies, it's about the story that we're telling with the experience that we're having with our friends with these toys. It's not about the toy itself. It's only as we become adults and these toys start to see value because that's a $10 toy. I'm not going to put that in the sand. Or that's a collectible. I'm not going to take it out of its box. Similarly, we, write, we should be writing code when we want to learn that is utterly disposable. At some point, it may take on value because you're like, yeah, temperature conversion. This is really cool. I'm really liking the way I'm doing this. So you put it up on GitHub. Instead of putting the toy on the shelf, now you're putting it on GitHub. And maybe it just gathers dust. Who cares? Maybe it inspires somebody else. Who knows? Surprise yourself. I did this with FizzBuzz, because um, I was always getting asked the question in the interviews. You know, Fizz, um, anyone here not familiar with FizzBuzz? No shame. OK. So you know it was super popular a few years ago. And uh, going through all these interviews, I got sick of answering it. And I said, I'm going to make a gem so I can just put it on a business card and hand them the goddamn business card and just be like, boom, next. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked. So I wrote this gem, and I released version one, or dot one. I'm like, yeah, sweet, joke gem. And uh, somebody uh, I worked with at the time looked at it and was like, oh, here's a better way to solve it. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's much better. So I released version dot two, promoted the hell out of it on Twitter, and that was kind of funny. Well, today it's on version 0 0.5, and I haven't touched it in about nine months because I've got nine different ways to solve FizzBuzz queued up in my inbox in a public folder. And someday I'll get around to actually solving it that way. But by doing this over and over again, getting to like five, six different release versions of a joke gem, I was able to play around with mini test versus RSpec. Um, how does this operate under 1.8? JRuby, RE, Rubinius. How does Travis CI going to work? How, do I, how can I leverage that? How can I deal with code climate? If you've listened at all to me in the last 30 minutes, you know that I probably didn't stop there. Cute, funny slide. I <laughs> registered fizzbuzz.io, which was actually the first that I know of, uh, FizzBuzz API on the internet. <laughs> uh, HTML, JSON, XML. And I didn't stop there either. It, um, there's a version of it. I disabled it because, you know, y'all are going to crash it. Um, 
It has an OAuth API. So you can log into Facebook, of course. Um, it actually farms it out to a queue, and it spins up an EC2 block to do FizzBuzz processing in the cloud, and then returns the results to via SMS text. <laughs> Just because. So again, each time, each one of these like little things, it's kind of funny, and it's a little bit about, oh, wow, this carries so obsessive. But it's really about finding that one thing that I wanted to learn about. I don't really know much about RabbitMQ. I'm going to play with it and see what happens. So this is just one technique about learning. And I wanted to mention a few others before I wrap up, because I am running a little bit late. Um, next time you're at lunch and sitting at your desk, turn off Twitter and go read a man page. Read a man page for a command that you use every single day. It's super embarrassing. I used, I've been using grep for 15, 18 years. I didn't know that you there was a dash n that would print out the line numbers since about a year ago. And I only found that out because I was like bored one day and read the man page. So go explore a little bit and like see what, is, what, other tool, what are the other options we use for the tools that we use every day. Um, adopt somebody's gem. Find somebody else's crazy joke gem or their, their passion project and fork it and find a way to improve it. I mean, I know you can. I absolutely guarantee that you can. Um, and then submit it back. And you know what, you're going to make their day. And you're going to learn a lot because you're not just reading somebody else's code, you're working with somebody else's code. You're taking it apart and see how someone else solves the problem. If you're lucky enough to pair a program, I am super jealous and I hope you're hiring. Um, but whether you work with a pair or, or you don't, find someone to pair with on a project, whether it be work or outside of work, because pairing supercharges this exchange of information and it lets both sides of our brain engage with a problem. We have to solve the problem with logic. Then we have to communicate about it with somebody else. And that ping-ponging back and forth lets these, both of these hemispheres of our brain engage with the moment. Um, if you can't find someone to pair with, um, maybe start a study group. You can do one online. You can start a book group online. That's really, really great. When somebody talks about that new awesome book, um, that's how I got through Sandy's, Metz's book, um, just by finding an on, a bunch of people online that wanted to read the book together. Go teach something. Find a Rails bridge or girl develop it or something. Volunteer and teach somebody else how to program. Maybe it's kids Ruby. You don't know how much you know and how much you don't know until a 65-year-old grandmother who just bought her very first computer and shows up at RailsBridge asks you how Bundler works. Yeah, that was a great moment for me. Uh, and I realized, like, maybe I don't really understand Bundler. Maybe I should look into this more. And again, this is about engaging the right side of my brain to explain something and the left side to have the logic and finding a way to communicate that. Because ultimately what I've done here is, as Alan Kay, one of the inventors of small talk said, a change in perspective is worth 80 points of IQ. So by changing my perspective continually, by adding one complication and seeing how does this solve the problem, by having to explain bundler to somebody, I'm changing, I'm gaining intelligence and smarts and insight into problems that I don't necessarily understand. So I'm going to wrap it up there because my slides don't work. That's odd. But in order to learn, and, you, and to learn really effectively, to have it stick with you over time, you need to reduce the risk of the situation. You need to practice, but you need to have fun with it, to explore and play with problems. Create spaces where failure is anticipated, where it's expected, and where you can embrace it and understand it for what it is. It's merely, this didn't work. Try something different. If you do that, and you do it well, or even if you do it badly, you'll find that in this unknown territory, the only monsters at the edge of the map are the ones that we're bringing with ourselves. You can do it. Thanks.